Welcome to Living Well with Alan Davey, and uh, I'm Rob Holding. Alan, good to have you back again. Nice to be here, Rob, under these circumstances. A bit yeah, different. well, I, I was thinking of grabbing one of those guitars in the background and singing the Lockdown Blues. Yeah, it's a bit like that for folk at the moment, actually, Rob. It's, uh, yeah, it's stretching a few people right now. I think one of the things, and this is what we want to talk about at the moment, is uh, it's, I mean, we're talking about living well and, and, and living the way that God created us to live. And part of that is trusting him that he is still in control. And what I see is a lot of Christians who, through their comments and social media in particular and in cafes, don't seem to be trusting that God is still in control. Yeah, there's um, the, the, the noise of COVID-19 has uh, become quite loud for folk and they're missing, they're missing the voice. And we do, Rob. You know, I'm guilty of it. We miss that still small voice because... The, 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 there is another voice out there that's um, fairly high pitched and uh, pretty relentless at the moment. So we need to be aware of that. That's absolutely right. We need to be aware that that his voice hasn't gone. Yeah. Um, it's it's always there. We just we just need to seek him out, like we always have needed to do, is to seek him out uh, because he promises to be available to us. Um, and he doesn't break his promise. I think we're, we're the ones, I'm the one that gets in the way of that deal. I, I, I found that this morning, earlier this morning, as I was rushing around trying to find this file and that folder and everything, and, and God's just saying, yeah, do you want us to just sit down and read your Bible for an hour? <laughs> I'm going, no, I haven't got time, you know. <laughs> but, uh, Alan, the, the, so many people... Uh, well, it's, it probably shouldn't say so many people. A lot of people don't realize what something like this, the effect that this has on us, um, because we think we're coping okay. And uh, at times it, it just it, it builds up and it builds up and it's like we're layering and layering more things into our psyche. Yeah. To the point yeah. where we're not doing okay. I think I mentioned in, in one of the talks uh, a, um, an event that happened to me that I reflect back on a fair bit now. Um, at the time it was important, but it's even become more important now. And that was, I was traveling to Cambridge a couple of years ago now, maybe, maybe not quite a couple of years ago to see a couple of clients. And from where I am here to Cambridge is just under half an hour. And so there's a little bit of time to mull things over. And I was in the car by myself mulling things over and I can, I can get myself into a bit of, uh, I can get a bit of head of steam up in my head when I've got a bit of time <laughs> on my hands and I was getting a bit of steam up in my head thinking about this virus that was coming into our country. It had come, but it wasn't, wasn't much yet. Um, where, where the economy was going, where the government, some of the government policies that I was uncomfortable with and, and numerous other things and my children and grandchildren that have been will be significantly affected by these going forward and, and what's that going to look like in the future. And so that was the head of steam. Yeah. And I got surprised to, to hear God into the conversation. And, and that doesn't happen to me often, but it did happen to me here. It, it caught me by surprise. And he entered the conversation and I, and I sensed him say to me that, uh, Alan, you're ranting and you're raving. I haven't finally got my attention, so now I'll go do something. Thank you very much. He said, um, I'm fully aware of the big picture, Alan. The issues are not the issue. I am. Yep. And when he said I am, he meant, and I knew it, and it, and it, and it touched me quite deeply. It was a profound I am, that he's the I am of the burning bush. He's the almighty. And um, And so he just went on to say, that that your your role is to do what you're called to do. You leave the big picture to me. Yeah. The big picture is my deal. The things that you're called to are your deal. So you go do the things you're called to. And I sensed him mean by that he's with me in those things. So Alan, focus on what you're called to do and leave the other stuff to me. And for me at that moment, that was a great weight off my shoulders because 
to some degree, some of these issues have actually got, yeah, there's a there's a fair head of steam going on yeah. with some of these issues now. You know, the consequence of COVID and um, and things like that and the pressures that are being applied for folk in regards to that, uh, they have got a lot greater and, they, and they're not going away quickly. How much of all of this, our reactions and your head of steam and everything, are to, and we've talked about this in the past too, are to do with our insecurities? Um, I run a, uh, a Kiwi Christian Poets page on Facebook and uh, one of the poems that was submitted to it, which I declined, was, uh, it wasn't anti-Australian, but it was all about that New Zealand-Australian dynamic uh, with New Zealand yeah. coming out on top. And, and I said to the lady that, that had sent it in, I said, look, that's, that's not what the page is about. But again, a, a lot of that comes from our insecurity as New Zealanders uh, as as you know, as a nation, and in our faith, a, a lot of our insecurity, I think, in a lot of our angst and all this worry, comes from not knowing that the I am is our I am. One hundred percent right, Rob, and uh, and yet we still are prone to do that. Yeah, you and me alike. Well, no, I'll say me. No, Maybe you and me real. alike. <laughs> so we are prone to do that. I I heard. Mark, I heard a quote from Mark Twain the other day, and it said something like this, so this is from him, to do what is right is commendable, to teach others to do what is right is also commendable and much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I often, I'll sit with a client or ponder things afterwards, and I think, how would I apply that to my life? Yeah. And I need to think that. And that's that's absolutely appropriate to think that because because if I can't apply it to my life, how can I expect them to do that? That's that's part of my thinking and be in regards to that. But also the realization that change isn't easy. Change actually is difficult, um, but change is essential. And so we need to we need to roll up our sleeves and say, okay, there are things in my life, beliefs I have, thoughts I have, feelings I have that are actually getting in the way of God here, getting in the way of truth here. You, you, um, and like I've said numerous times, the whole quest of our life is to regain that image we were created in, yeah. which, which is what you were referring to, that image of he is the I am. We, and in that respect, in, in, he, he's not only the I am, he's the father. He is the I am, but he, we've also we're also allowed to know him as the Father. So he is our heavenly Father, you know, our Father who is in heaven. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on yeah. earth as it is in heaven. You, you know, and and on it goes, and it and it reorientates us. It's it's a it's a funny thing. I was thinking the other day. I was uh, involved in a um, a funeral service. A, um, a lockdown type funeral service. There were only 10 people in it. And the lady that had died loved prayer. So that was beautiful. Yeah. She would love it when people would pray. And I thought to myself, I wonder why she loves that. And one of the reasons we love prayer is because it orientates ourself to something beyond us. And that something is a someone, and that someone is our Heavenly Father who actually wants to connect to us. Well, that's very much Peter walking on the water, isn't it? When he was focused, I mean, the Bible yeah. tells us when he was focused on Jesus, he walked on the water. It's when he started looking at the circumstances around him and worrying about him. Because, I mean, you're looking at Jesus, everything's fine. You start looking at the wind and the waves. You're not worried about the wind and the waves. You're worried about me drowning and dying. <laughs> you know, so keep keep the focus on him, and and uh, and as you say, it's you know the other thing that as God said to you, keep the focus on doing what you're told to do, which is again with Peter at the uh, the on the seashore of Galilee when Jesus made the breakfast for them, and Peter seeing John, he goes, you know, well, what about John? And Peter, uh, you know, Jesus's response: Mind your own business. You do what yeah. I told you to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But if I'm not again, if if I'm not confident in who I am in Christ, I'm not going to be confident in doing what I think Christ has told me to do. That's right, and that's why that's our our view of God, our view of Christ is essential, isn't it? Because we're 
we we live in a broken world with a healing God. Yep. So we still live in a broken world, but this God is genuinely a healing God, and we and we get profound glimpses of that through through the Gospels and and the like, where where He entered into this world and suffered and died. What, why did He do that? I often say to people, why were we created? Um, what was the point? What was the purpose? Of, yeah, of God creating humanity, and and the point was fellowship, so that He could walk with us and we could walk with Him, so that He could actually experience us. And that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. That God wants to experience us, us, but He longs for us to experience Him. And and then the fall came and that got broken, and so we've ended up in this world disorientated. We're now not focused on walking with God in the garden. We've we've entered into this world and we look around this world and to some degree what we get as we as we observe this world and our life and the interactions is we get this sense that my survival is all up to me. Yeah. And, yeah. and and then with that sense, we say, okay, that means I can control things. That means it's up to me to make all this happen. That means when stuff goes wrong, I've got to work really, really hard to put it right. That means I've got to do everything right so stuff doesn't go wrong. And then we wind ourselves up because we've we've lost the right view. But but <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it? Because my survival is all up to me is not accurate. No. We do have God, and he wants to be involved. But for me to give that power away to him, it's kind of like, oh, flip, I've just made myself vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, other, the other dynamic of that is, is to the reason why I need to fix it and I need to make it right is I need to get myself in the right place so that God will love me properly and you go that's just that is so so wrong it's so so human yeah it is <laughs> and it is so so wrong and and i am just so grateful that that's wrong yeah because how much is enough what do i need to do to appease a holy god well there's nothing i can do to do that so i'll just whip myself into a frenzy wouldn't i we do you know and, and and so i'm profoundly wound up like the meerkat standing Outside his meerkat hole, looking around uh, in, in sheer panic, waiting for the axe to fall or the proverbial lion to attack. Yep. But whereas when we read the scriptures, you know, you know, Psalm 4, verse 8 says, I will lie down and sleep in peace because you and you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. That's right. How well do I do that? in the middle of the night when i when i'm winding myself up with one of my rents <laughs> and so there's the rubber meeting the road isn't it yeah and and that's when that's when we actually can orientate ourselves and absolutely need to you, you know psalm 23 the lord is my shepherd yeah yep. i shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides, guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's impressive, Rob. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 knowing who you are and knowing who God is. And, Absolutely. And that only comes. It really only comes, Alan, from from Scripture. I mean, you and I know we because uh, a person who we've we've talked about and. Um, this person was was given a scripture to speak out loud three times a day, yeah. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, until that scripture starts to have an impact on the way you yeah. think, because they've been thinking a particular way which is opposite to the way that God's way is. And so speaking the scripture, I love what Derek Prince says, you know, faith comes from, from hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Yep. So if you want your faith to increase, speak the word of God out loud. Yep. And it's it's refocusing. Um, is it Romans Romans twelve? Uh, you know, don't be transformed to the world, don't but, but the don't conform to the world. Yeah, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah, and and that has to be spending time with God in prayer and in the Word. It, it absolutely has to be. I was listening to something about Charles Wesley. And, uh, and they talked about how busy he was, and it was profound. I think it was Charles Wesley. And it was profound what he, what he was doing in his life. And his line was, I'm so busy, I've got to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and pray for three hours. Yep. And you go, oh, heck. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Charles Wesley. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you, Lord, that you called him to that. But, but his, point, his point is valid. Yeah. You know, because like I said before, prayer orientates us to that which is outside of us, that which is untainted by the world that we find ourselves in, and yet is still able to affect profoundly by coming into this world in me and through me. Yep. Wow. That's pretty impressive, Rob. You know, for, for me personally, I, I can't imagine a life more profound, significant than that. We've got to make sure that we don't overbalance on the me, me, me side, because what we're talking about here is knowing who I am in Christ, who I am in the Lord, and not thinking that me, me, me can do it all. Because I remember after 12 months of pastoring, I sat down with the Lord and I said, well, I think I've done a reasonably good job over the last 12 months. Maybe I should give you a chance. <laughs> You know, um, getting back to something we, we talked about earlier, though, and, and that's, the, that's the, the getting wound up, the position that we're getting in, uh, that we get ourselves in. Uh, and particularly at times like this, where even, even in the Christian world, we are so uh, divided. And we're no longer divided on theology. We're divided on a vaccine and, yeah. and a virus. But we get to a point uh, because we are, what's the word I'm looking for? We're so adaptable that, that the change comes slowly and we don't notice where we are. And it's only, I mean, behind me on this side is some very, very steep stairs. There's only, I think there's about 25 of them in all. And I can walk up them reasonably well. But it would get to the point if, if I wasn't watching my weight and watching my fitness that it's only when you can only walk up half the steps and you have to sit down and catch your breath that you realize yeah. that you have been slowly, slowly, slowly getting out of shape. And in our minds, we're also very adaptable and we don't sometimes realize how far we've fallen from that wellness that God wants for us. Yeah, and that, and that is indicated, like you say, Rob, by how we might react to other Christians in circumstances where we may not agree with their stand yeah. and we become a bit um, harsh about that or critical about that. Antagonistic. Or, yeah, condemning, yeah, all that. And, and, and we're in error when we do that. There's nothing wrong with having a disagreement. Uh, that, that's healthy, actually. We need that. Yeah. That's, that's robust. That's yeah. actually iron sharpening iron, call it whatever you like, those sorts of things. That's robust. But but um, bitterness, um, hate, oh, that's possibly strong, too strong a word, but it can come to that, actually. You know, as, as we move down that way, yeah. um, it's it's... Surpri to some degree, it's surprising, and to some other degrees, it's not. How quickly a a group of people, if that's the right word, a culture is probably a better way, a culture can shift into them and us and, and feed on that. Uh, and that's human nature, yep. but that's not meant to be our nature. No, our nature is supposed to be, be of God, yeah. and we're supposed yeah. to be transformed. Yeah, yeah, into the likeness of Christ. Yeah. Now there's our challenge. And so like we've been saying, Rob, if we're not if we're not reading the scripture, if we're not pr genuinely praying, um if we're not uh in 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 good fellowship, we by nature of a river that's flowing, 
because the cu the culture is the river that's flowing by yep. nature of the river that's flowing if we're not swimming against that current we are with the current yeah um, and we are meant to be against the current i don't mean against as in you know tea yeah. with you i mean against as indifferent you know we're people of the way that's it. that was that was what we were first called i think back in the day you know people of the way meaning not not that way they were going that way it was so noticeably different that they were going that way not that way sharon used to have this wonderful example that she used for kids in uh, when she was doing sunday school and, and youth teaching and basically it was it was uh, it, it was the transforming by the renewing of your mind and she'd get a um she'd get a glass of water and she'd put a couple of sprinkles of coffee in it and then stir yeah. it around of course it becomes a bit murky and then she put a, another couple in and become you know dark brown and eventually the, the thing's black with coffee yeah. and you go yeah. well how do you, how can you cleanse the glass yeah and so what she'd do is she'd pick up a jug of pure water and she would just pour the pure water into the cup and keep pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring until all the impurities had gone out of the glass and it was now clean again. And this is, the, the, it's what we put into our minds. If I tell you a story about some friends of ours. Now, they actually ran a ministry called Tracts for Free. And um, they designed and printed millions of tracts, which we actually, Sharon, was part of the distributing for them. And so they were sent all over the world for free. You could you could email in and say, look, I'd, I'd like 10,000 tracts of multiple tracts, and we would package them up and send them off. Sadly, they started looking at all these conspiracy theory bits and pieces on the internet. It started reasonably innocently with uh, with aspartame, uh, and then it went into super size me. But then it went into some weird cultish Christian things on the internet, on YouTube. Yeah. And they got hooked up in what's called the Ephraimite conspiracy, which is the, the lost tribes and all that sort of thing. And we had a phone call from them asking at one point, they said, how many tracts have you got left? And we had a quick count up. We said, oh, I think there's about 11,000 on the shelf. And they said, well, put them in a box. We're coming to pick them up so we can destroy them. And I said, why? And they said, well, they've got the name Jesus on them. We don't pronounce his name Jesus anymore. We only say Yahusha. Right, yeah. You know, so they'd slowly started yeah. innocently enough, but it's slowly, slowly, slowly been putting the wrong thing in the glass. And I think what our problem, the reason why we got so hit up over COVID, over what the government's doing, this, that, and the other thing, or anything, is that we're not pouring that pure water of the word into our glass. You know, the question he asks us every day is, will you trust me today? Hmm. We need to know who it is that we're trusting, of course. But it's it, we do have the Bible. It is there. It is available. It's it's um, And as you read the scriptures, I mean, I, I just... I am so encouraged. You know, I, I, can, I, I still tear up over some scriptures that were significant to me years ago. Yeah. As I read them, it's rem, it reminds me of Flip. He, he was involved then. He's involved now. He hasn't changed from there. He's the same now. Yesterday, today, and forever. He is. He actually is. And it is him. Let's, what's the saying? The main thing in life is to keep the main thing in life, the main thing in life. Yeah. And I think we can we can analyze ourselves, especially as Christians. I think we can analyze ourselves and say, where is Jesus in my day today? What's what's consuming me more today? Is it a virus or a vaccine or 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 I don't know, it could be any other thing, but that's certainly topical for us right now. Yeah. Um, and, and that will eventually pass to one day not be the big event. Um, here's, here's a line I really, really like. What story do you want to tell when all you have is the story to tell? And what that means is, okay, one day, and I don't know when, but let's hope and pray, one day this vaccine and this virus won't be the big deal. It will have got itself sorted somehow. Yep. So one day we'll be looking back on this as we look back on all sorts of other things in our life. How? What can you do today so that when that day comes, you're able to tell a good story? And what I mean by a good story is, no, I did what was right. 
I was I was respectful. I wasn't malicious. I wasn't um, condemning or critical or, or or ridicule people. Yeah. So so when all you have is a story to tell, what story is it that you would be wanting to tell? And and where is Jesus going to appear in that? Uh, you know, one of the things well, that's that's happening at the moment uh, amongst the Christian world, and we don't you know we don't want to take sides, but uh, there's this. Uh, move to uh, petition the government, do this, that, and the, you know, protest the government, do the, you know, and and people are saying, you know, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Bible, and I'm going, yeah, but actually, if you look at them, they had the right attitude. They were asked by the king to do something that they couldn't do. Mm. Their faith did not allow them to do that, and so they went to the king, and respectfully said, "I'm sorry." We can't do this. Yeah. And the king said in a rage, well, if you don't do it, I'll throw you into the fire. And they said, we appreciate that, mm-hmm. but we can't do it. So handcuff me and throw me in the fire. Um, it's, and again, to, to me, it's getting back to the confidence of knowing that the I am is the I am. Nothing yeah. takes God by surprise. Yeah, you know, if you're if you're a business owner and uh, and there are many in New Zealand that are suffering financially through this, but if you're a Christian business owner, God doesn't go, oh, flip, Alan, I'm sorry, I didn't see that one coming. Mm. He goes, no, it's trust in me. Walk on the water, look at me. Don't worry about the waves. I write articles. I think I've mentioned this. I write articles for a local paper, and I. And I was stirred actually over the weekend to write an article that will be going in next week. I'd already prepared one, but something cropped up, and and I and I, and I got what I thought was a poke in my spirit. Yeah. And 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 I've learned to respect that and pursue that. I've written an article. I'll actually read it to you. It's only it's five hundred words, so it's yep. four or five minutes. That's all to try and help folk to to get a bit of a perspective here. Now, the article goes in our local newspaper, and it's it's a secular paper, so I'm privileged to be able to write for a secular paper. And so I'm also mindful of not overstepping my mark and using it to proselytise or something like that. Um, I hope I haven't overstepped my mark. (laughs) But I'll read this this to you. And if if you wanted it, I'll send it to you as an email, Rob, and if anybody wants it, they're welcome to have it. But anyway, um, so here we go. I was reading a book the other day and came across an interesting story about how during the bombing raids over England in the Second World War, thousands of children were orphaned and left to starve. The fortunate ones were rescued and placed in refugee camps where they received food and good care. But due to the trauma they had faced, many of these children could not sleep at night for fear of waking up and finding themselves once again homeless and without food. Finally, someone came up with the idea of giving each child a piece of bread to hold at bedtime. All through the night, the bread was a comforting reminder to them that today I ate and I will eat again tomorrow. By holding on to the bread, these children could now finally sleep in peace. Though we're not facing anything of this magnitude with COVID-19 in our midst, there are significant fears and pressures for many of us. These fears can certainly bring with it substantial tensions leading to things like sleepless nights. Without seeking to minimise the genuine issues the times we are in are generating, my concern is we can allow these events to overwhelm and consume us to the point where we become full of fear fearful, Mm. which in turn can rob us of all the good that is still available in our lives. If we submit to our fears, we are allowing those fears to overwhelm and dominate us. I heard someone comment that, that what we fear the most becomes like our God. That is what they mean by that was we submit to it, we bow to it, we give ourselves to it, we serve it. We can tell what we're full of by what spills out when something or someone bumps into us. Are we hateful, thankful, resentful, grateful, faithful, fearful? To a large degree, 
larger than we might realize, we get to choose what we focus on and fill ourselves with. Fearful or grateful, fearful or hopeful, fearful or faithful. We can't be full of both. We become what we fill ourselves with. Reflecting back to the story at the start about children being comforted by sleeping with bread, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. He also prayed, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. God longs to offer fresh daily bread, his presence and provision to comfort and sustain us in and through all the uncertainties that lie ahead. By holding on to this bread, we are able to proclaim, as one of the Psalms does, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. What might I will not allow myself to give into fear look like for you today? Mm. Yeah, that's good. So um, we're noticing probably all of us are noticing that the tension is amping up, uh, that, that, that there is fear-generated responses, reactions to things that are going on uh, in this COVID domain. Um, we need to fill ourselves with just everything we've talked about, Rob. Yeah, with God. With God. We need to fill ourselves with God. Yeah, we do. Yeah, because because we become, like I said, we become what we fill ourselves with, and and that's that's actually a truism, isn't it? It's yeah. it's, it's like sharing your wife. You know, you you pour in, you know, teaspoon by teaspoon, you're pouring in the black stuff, and then and when somebody bumps against that full cup, what's spilling out? Well, all that stuff. Spills all the black out. stuff spills out. Yeah. You you pour in the living water the bread of life, the living water. You pour that in and the black stuff is is displaced and becomes less than. Yeah. Um, that's the quest of our life. That's that's salt and light. That's what we're called to be. So please, folk, let's, let's fill ourselves with him. Yeah, I think one of the hard parts is, as we mentioned before, is um, it it's only when something like this happens when somebody bumps you, when crisis comes, that you actually notice what you're filled with. Because we might think that we're filled with reasonably clear water, and then somebody bumps us, and out comes all this vindictive hatred, and, and you go, where on earth did that come from? And I think at that point, Alan, it's, it's where we need to stop and take stock of ourselves and go, actually, how godly am I? How much do I reflect Jesus Christ? We are privileged to be able to do that. Privileged to be able to have him, Christ, as our as our plumb line. He's way more than that. But but at least the plumb line is straight. Yes. And so when we put our lives against his plumb line, and my life can be pretty crooked, I go, yeah, nah, crooked. There's there's no, there's no. I, I can't get away with pretending it's not crooked when I've got a straight line to compare it to. Yeah. Um, and we do in Christ. And that's that's the call of us. You know, um, oh heck, I've completely forgotten the scripture, but it's 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 you know, from glory to glory, ever increasing glory. That's for us to be that that's that sanctification. And uh and that's you, you know, I, I think. Sharon's analogy is a very good one. You know, we just let's just keep pouring the water in. Yeah. Let's keep pouring the living water. Don't don't get too freaked out by what bubbles up. Become aware of it. If we need to, we must have become aware of it, but realize that okay, all Christ is doing is bringing it to our attention so we can deal with it. He's not saying you disgust me, you disgusting person. He's saying, Alan, this is there. This yep. is there. It's not good for you. It's not good for your community. It's, it's, it's improve, improve. I'm here for you. Hold my hand. Let's work on this together. I mean, he talks about the the process of the of the crucible. Uh, you know, you put the gold or the silver in the crucible, and you put the heat underneath it, 
at the right heat so that the dross comes to the top so that God can scoop that dross off our lives. But we need to recognize it's dross yeah. too, otherwise we'll just mix it back in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the interesting thing with that story, as I understand it, when that dross is gone, the, the, the person getting rid of the dross, you can see his reflection is able to be seen in, in, in the gold because it's so pure. Yep. Yeah. And so that's the goal for us is people, people oh, <laughs> it's the goal, isn't it? <laughs> we, we, ref, we reflect Christ as well as we can in this human form. Yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> we, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 I've said this before, we're stuck between, not stuck, but we're, we're, we're in between the tension of the dust of the ground and the breath of the divine. And sometimes the dust bubbles up, you know, yeah. sometimes the, the dust cloud comes up. That's okay. That's okay. Just keep, keep, keep going up. When you're talking about the plumb line, somebody uh, said once that uh, the plumb line, uh, that 1 Corinthians 13 is a great plumb line for us to use. Uh, to look at where we are. I mean, it's, it's mostly used incorrectly in weddings, but, you know, it's, you know, lovers say, okay, is Rob long-suffering? Is Rob at the moment being kind? Is Rob puffing himself up? Uh, is Rob behaving unseemly? Is he seeking his own? Because if he is, he's on the wrong side of the plumb line, you know? And it's it's just, you know, four verses that you can look at and you go, okay, where am I? In, in in where God's wanting to take me, where am I at the moment? And where, where am I when the pressure comes on? And these times, these are genuine trying times that, uh, that reveal that. Yeah. Revelation requires application to become transformation. And so when, that, when we have that revealing, the revelation, oh, heck, the pl- I'm, 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 I, I, I don't... I don't I, according to the plumb line, I'm not straight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't reached the mark. It's not. It's not like oh heck, what a what a you know, what a wretched. Well, what is it? Uh, Paul in Romans seven says uh, the things I do I don't want to do. The things I don't want to do. I keep this doing. I'm doing. Oh, what a wretched man I am. Who's going to save me from this body of wrath? Thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I go, what a blooming relief that is. Yeah, absolutely. I go back to Romans 7 and look at it every now and then go, I'm pleased that's in there because thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) You know, here's the thing. We don't fall from grace. We fall into grace if we allow ourselves to. So when we stuff up, not if, when we stuff up, hopefully hopefully not too big, but no matter if it's big, it's big. When we stuff up, we need to realize he's there. He's there. And we need to cry out to him and say, God, help me, please. But you you said, I mean, the, the, the revelation goes to application. application. See, the thing, uh, years ago, um, I got to, back in the early days of video cameras. And uh, well, for me, it was anyway. And I, and I had this video camera. Uh, it didn't, didn't go on its own. You had to plug it into the VCR to record. And I went around to a friend's place. Now, now she was, uh, she was a mama cass. Not the singer, Mama Cass, the big yeah, Mama I, Cass. I hear you. She knew it. Everybody knew it, you know, and, and, and we loved her anyway. But, but we put this video camera on top of the TV and it was facing her. And she just looks at herself on the TV and she goes, oh, my goodness, I'm fat. Yeah. Right? That was the revelation. Yeah. But she never did anything. Yeah. She remained, you know, for the next 25, 30 years, she remained that size. I, because I want to get into a healthier state now that I'm in my 60s, uh, I jump on the scales. I've lost 30 odd kilos at the moment. And I jump oh, on the yeah. scales. And when it goes up, I go, ah, that's revelation that what I'm doing isn't working. I need to put application and be stronger in in changing this. Now, from a human point of view, that means a little bit of willpower and uh, eating less and exercising more or eating better and exercising better. Yep. But in the spiritual sense, as you say, it's it's made that revelation, the application is you stop and you take that to God. I've, I've written that up as a handout. And at the bottom of the handout, I've put in this verse of scripture. Uh, and this is from James 1 verse 22 to 25, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like a man that looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Yeah, but we can be fooled into into thinking that we're okay. And and again, that's where the, the revelation part comes from. And that also comes from the word of God. Yeah. And 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 honest asking yourself the honest question, how how am I, you know, according to Christ, how am I going? Would he be would it would he be pleased with how I'm living my life at the moment? Yeah. Not as in condemnation, but absolutely as in as as in um a, a sense of um challenge or conviction, yeah, not condemnation, but conviction. I don't I don't believe I'm very confident God doesn't condemn. I'm very confident he convicts. Yeah. And we need to respond to that conviction because if we're not going to respond to that conviction, we're still walking on the road that's going to lead to destruction. And that destruction, I promise, we know is not good. No. So I, I said this last time, I think, sin always under-delivers on its promise. And what I mean by that, you know, pornography, wow, flip, that's, wow, that's amazing. Where does it go? Alcohol, oh, wow, have a good night, have another good night, have another good night. Where does that go? Gambling, where does that go? You know, all these vices or call it what, whatever you like, even, even gluttony, where does that go? Um, well, it doesn't go to a good place. No. It goes downhill, but, always. Yeah, yeah, always. Yet leads you away to destruction. You know, wide is the road that leads to destruction and many walk on it, but narrow is the road that leads to life and not many find it. Our orientation is Christ. I can imagine that you are dealing with people at the moment that are coming to you because of the current crisis. Um, so we've got people who are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast who aren't able to make it to, uh, to Morinsville. What would you say to them, those that are struggling, but maybe whether it's family or business or, or whatever, what would you say to them? There's a, there's a concept I use, let's keep our eye on the donut, not the hole. There are still good things in life. Let's, um, cause, cause remember I'm a counselor who is a Christian. I'm not just a Christian counselor. So I don't, I don't, I, I might say to the odd client, if I feel it's appropriate, you know, do you have a spiritual understanding to life? Is there is there something more to life that you can perhaps see? And 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 I'll and, and if if they engage with that, then I'll gently walk down that road a little bit with them. Yeah. But always being mindful that um, that I'm a counselor, but also being mindful that I'm a pursuer of truth for them, and the truth will set them free. And we know who the truth giver is. Yeah. So I long for people to not only hold on to the truth, but the truth giver. So what you're saying in some ways is, uh, again, to use the Bible phrase is to count your blessings, to, to not focus on the negative things that are going on at the moment, but focus on the positive things. Yeah. There's another little, seeing as how I'm in my office, I can, I can turn to all sorts of things. I'll see if I can find this one quickly, Rob. I like, I, I like this concept. <clears throat> Here we go. Don't indulge in dreaming about things that you don't have. But think about the blessings of the things you do have and then thankfully remember how you would long for them if they were not yours. Say that again. Don't indulge in dreaming about the things you don't have. So in other words, don't get overwhelmed with all that you don't have, all that's not going right, all that's going wrong. Don't indulge yourself in that. I mean, we've got to do due diligence, so that's not what I'm talking about. Yep. Um, but think about the blessings of the things you still do have. And then, as, as perspective, thankfully remember how you would long for them if they weren't yours. So perspective is look at what you do have and think if they weren't there, how much you'd miss them. So appreciate them now. Yeah. Focus on them, those things now. Um, be, be, because 
Yes, as, as I said in this little article that I read, there are genuine trying times. I mean, you'll be facing some, I'm facing some. We're all facing genuine trying times. So I'm not saying let's pretend they're not there, but what I am saying is let's get ourselves a perspective here. Yeah. And this perspective is, for us as Christians, it is up. And the perspective for those that don't have, don't yet have a faith in Christ, um, it's okay, what do you still have that's good in your life? Don't forget that. Yeah, hold on to yes. that. Yes, you need to work on those things, and I understand that, and you need to uh, put some energy and some resources into um, managing that and doing due diligence. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not negating that, but what I am saying is when you when you just allow yourself to be consumed by the, the boil on your arm and you pick away at the boil and it starts to get more infected, you still got the rest of your body is still actually functioning. Yeah. So let's uh let's not get too distracted. Yeah. Is it interesting with the boils? One of my favorite stories is that story of Hezekiah with the boil, um, where he was dying, and we know from, from reading the different scriptures and Kings Chronicles and Isaiah that he had a boil somewhere on him that the doctors couldn't fix. And uh, God sent Isaiah, the prophet, to him to say, yep, that's it, you're going to die. But Hezekiah cried out to God, and God sent Isaiah back to say, I've heard your prayer, and I will heal you. And at that point, they went and put a poultice of figs on the boil, and he was healed. And I yeah. always think, I wonder if they tried the poultice of figs before. Right. You know, I mean, the doctors weren't stupid. They knew how to fix boils. But unless God says in that situation, unless the God says those words, I will heal you, the poultice isn't going to make any difference. If God says, I won't heal you, you can do whatever medically. And I think in, in our situations, whether it's financial or whatever, is we need to take it to God like Hezekiah did. We need to take our circumstances to God and wait for his response. And knowing again with perspective, you know, we, we talk about the Goliaths in our life. Well, from God's perspective, David and Goliath were the same height because he was looking down from above. Yeah, it's good. You know, and that's the same God that is with us in this situation as well. That's like I said, Rob, um, when, when I sense God enter into my conversation, my rent in the car, you know, your issues haven't, you haven't finally got my attention. Um, the issues are not the issue, I am. Yeah. And he, he specifically is. used that word, I am. He specifically used that word. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know, and when he said that to me, in my in my soul, in my spirit, in my being, I knew exactly what he meant. It was an <laughs> orientation for me. It was yeah. like, Alan, look up. Yeah. Don't look around. You look around, you're Peter in the water, you're going to sink. Yeah. But Jesus was still there. Peter just took his eyes off him. Let's not take our eyes off the Almighty. No, I love it this. and I hate it when God does things like that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like you remember Max Headroom, the, the little blip vert that came up, and it's got God just does this little boom. You go, okay, I'll shut up now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one incident. I was walking uh, when I first worked for Rima in Auckland, and I lived uh, an hour's walk away, about about four, four kilometres away. And I was walking home in the dark one night and it was starting to rain and I had a hole in my shoe and I was, I was just about to, to, to get miserable to God about it. And he just showed me this little blipvert memory of a story of missionaries in, um, I think, Arian Jaya that walked three days in bare feet across rivers to deliver the gospel to a yeah. village. And I go, yeah. I'm not going to say anything. But that's that's again it's 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 that perspective putting it back into the God perspective, not the the me 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 perspective. Yeah. The only me perspective is who I am in God, and I can only get that from listening to Him. I wrote this little prayer out, um, basically for this little funeral that I took. It was a lovely little occasion, and it, very very brief. It says, "You are Creator, we are creature. You are Savior, we are lost. You are Healer, we are broken." You are father, we are child. You are shepherd, we are sheep. Perspective. Yeah. 
Alan, as we close out this, uh, which I don't think we've done on any of our podcasts, we may have done it before, but can I ask you to pray for those that are struggling at the moment? Sure. Love to, Rob. Father, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture, the flock under your care, and you are the good shepherd. You are the good shepherd. You laid your life down for us, your sheep. You've done all you can, and you do all you can, and you're doing all you can to, uh, to reach us, to heal us, to guide us, to provide for us. We thank you so much for that. So, God, as we face these uncertain times, we recognise that you are with us through the belly. We need not fear any evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. Thank you for that. I pray for all those listening, Lord God, that they will experience your presence and your provision. God, as they open themselves up, as they do what they can, come, Father, and do what they can't. Have your way here. Be glorified in our lives. May you be magnified through us. May, we, may, may you be seen in and through our lives. Come and have your way. Mm. Amen. Amen. Alan, thank you so much. Look forward to next time. Me too, Rob. Bless you. Bye-bye, mate. Thank you. And thank you for watching and for listening. Um, we'll put a link. Well, Alan's, Alan's website link is in the, uh, in the description anyway. We'll put a link there for you if you want to get a hold of that article that Alan wrote or if you want to contact him, do so through his website. And uh, do check the other, uh, if this has impacted you, do check the other uh, podcasts, the Living Well podcasts that we have done. Maybe there'll be something in there for you as well. God bless you.